Today, I will discuss a journal originating from John Henry Newman's Catholic University of Ireland. The Atlantis was an overtly academic periodical inspired by John Henry Newman and William K. Sullivan, who founded and supported the journal is debatable, and I will outline this debate today. I will also explore the publication's unique structure and how it impacted the audience's reception. Why study the Atlantis, though? Well, for one, it's associated with John Henry Newman. It circulated in London as well, which gave it a presence beyond Ireland and throughout the UK. It is also closely related to the Catholic University of Ireland upon its establishment, a university which has prominence even today through the National University of Ireland constituent University College Dublin. Therefore, it's a monumental publication that captures an important point in Irish Catholic history. The establishment of their own college, a prominent Catholic faculty community developing, and a highly intellectual journal finding success, albeit moderate, are all of interest to researchers and aficionados of 19th century periodicals. The Atlantis was established in January 1858, and it operated until May 1870. Originally, it was subtitled A Journal of Literature and Science, which holds significance for the publication, as I will discuss later in this video. It published a mixture of science and literature, all of which was academic in nature. Its contents were dense, and some would even argue highbrow. But these writings accommodated a unique place in periodical literature. Prior to the Atlantis, academic literature and academic subjects received little attention in Irish periodicals. Even in wider UK periodicals, academic literature was not published widely. John Henry Newman was the primary figurehead for this publication. For modern readers, he is the most relatable figure because of his other accomplishments and his notoriety as a cardinal and as an academic. Newman is one of the 19th century's most notable figures, and much of his biography cannot be covered here. Any overview that I provide of Newman will be woefully inadequate because of the time limitations that I have, so please consult the Dictionary of National Biography, produced by the Oxford University Press, which has pages upon pages of information about Newman. Newman truly is a fascinating figure. He was an Oxford academic who wrote extensively about the Church of England, church structures and how they were organized, and theological history. His tracts were particularly critical of the Church of England, and they drew heavy criticism from Newman's detractors. By the 1850s, Newman was heavily involved in establishing the Catholic University of Ireland, delivering lectures about liberal education and developing the mind. Some of Newman's more notable writing derives from these lectures and is most pertinent to his work with the Atlantis. These core ideas are central to a series of writings called The Idea of a University, which explores various aspects of establishing universities, how universities should teach, and even how universities should be constructed. At its core is Newman's belief of knowledge for its own sake. His prose discusses this concept extensively, particularly with how university objectives should be perceived and how students should approach education and acquiring knowledge. These ideas have been scrutinized more extensively recently, particularly among universities which try to accommodate job market trends and which consider employability and success as codependent elements. Stefan Collini discusses Newman's views on this subject extensively, and he even bridges the gap between Newman's writing and today. His book, What Are Universities For?, is a good place to start on the subject, and the lecture that he conducted about these issues is available on YouTube under the title Newman and Now. These principles ultimately manifest themselves in the Atlantis, which contain articles that were devoted to an academic style which accommodated a specialized audience. The magazine's contents were aimed not to entertain, but to transmit and disseminate knowledge among people. If one were to describe the journal's approach through a more modern expression, one would say that it took a build and they will come approach to its readership, publish the content, and those who wish to pursue knowledge in these fields will migrate to the journal. Much like Newman's notion of knowledge for its own sake, outlined in the idea of a university, the Atlantis pursued knowledge and published information without dwelling on how it would attract a broader audience. While this was undoubtedly a consideration, the goal of publishing high-quality information superseded attracting an audience. Rightly or wrongly, the Atlantis' content closely reflected Newman's own philosophies about university learning. Given how long the publication lasted, these principles were not wholly unfounded. However, there is much debate about Newman's role in the Atlantis. He was an attractive name to advertise the publication, and he helped to establish the periodical. Much of the periodical's contents and aims were influenced by Newman's vision, but William K. Sullivan is widely believed to be the main agent who made the periodical work. Newman is suggested to be a nominal editor only, while Sullivan undertook the majority of the periodical's editorial procedures, especially in science. 
Andalini goes so far as to say that Sullivan established the journal, not Newman. This notion is quite valid considering Sullivan's own capabilities when it came to publishing. Although Newman is the most recognizable face associated with the publication, William K. Sullivan is a prominent figure in his own right. Sullivan was born in Cork in 1822. He was a chemist by trade, earning a PhD and subsequently working at the Museum of Economic Geology. In 1856, he became a professor of chemistry at the Catholic University of Ireland and soon after became a part of the Royal Irish Academy. Later in his career, he became the president of Queen's College Cork and performed admirably in this role, allowing the school to flourish under his guidance. Sullivan's background made him more inclined to focus on science, and indeed, The Atlantis was designed to be a scientific journal first and a literary journal second. Sullivan's goal was to promote the Catholic University of Ireland's science faculties and to promote the work of Catholic scientists who were often not credited as serious scientific scholars because of their faith's priorities. Even Newman, whose preoccupation was more with religious and literary matters, considered the Atlantis primarily as a scientific journal. The literary contents were meant as some sort of padding to fill the space that scientific study did not because, to quote Newman, science does not deal in words and thus the scientific studies did not occupy as much space as the literary specimens did. Regardless of intent, this odd mixture did not sit well with all of the Atlantis's readers. This approach was not detrimental given that the publication lasted 12 years, but the combination was not as endearing to readers as one may presume. Perhaps it was because the literary works were not taken as seriously and were not intended to have superior quality. Perhaps it was because the scientific studies were assumed to be shorter and were not intended to have physical prominence in the journal. Perhaps a combination of these elements, philosophies, and approaches hindered the journal's prominence and ultimately its success. The Atlantis did receive some positive acclaim from prominent members of society like Manuel Johnson and Sir John Acton. For others, however, the journal was a bit perplexing. Several readers at that time could not grasp the marriage between a science journal and a literary journal. Most journals featured either one element or the other, but the Atlantis' unconventional approach defied reader expectations and seems to have diminished the breadth of the readership. Sales also suffered from the intellectual material that the journal produced. In a sense, the journal's content and its objectives seemed to be at odds. The Atlantis published wide-ranging content that an outside researcher would assume would interest a variety of readers. Theoretically, it would attract a greater readership because it encompassed something for everyone. But the academic nature of the writing precluded this wide readership from forming, especially in Ireland where it originated. Over the 12 years that it was published, it never established a large Irish readership. Rather than attracting more readers with the breadth of the journal's content, the density of this content rendered it more of a niche publication. In short, it became rather exclusive rather than inviting. The rigid academic content was not produced without much consideration, however. One may assume that the editor's goal was to reach a large audience, but reality was quite different. Newman and Sullivan did not establish the journal without understanding what kind of content it would produce or without knowing what goals they wanted to achieve. Including intellectual content was deliberate because, according to Tom Clyde, Newman and his editors wanted the journal to be taken seriously as an academic publication. Their goal was to assert the new university's seriousness. So rather than trying to appeal to a broad audience, it can be concluded that the journal produced a range of material spanning numerous faculties and disciplines. This established the journal and, by extension, the Catholic University of Ireland as a serious academic endeavour. The publication showed that, while it was a Catholic university, the university's programming and research was multidisciplinary and its faculty could excel on numerous levels. The Atlantis was out to prove that the new university was a veritable player in education and research and that everybody should heed it. Was the Atlantis successful? Well, yes and no. It accomplished its goals and remained steadfast in its principles and its approach. It found some success if this is how a critic chooses to approach the magazine. But it never did achieve a ton of sales. Although sales were not the primary goal, making the content more accessible to the wider public would have enhanced the publication's prominence. The faculty and others affiliated with the university did form a community through the publication, and the publication is on par with others of this period, like the Cambridge and Oxford magazine, which was published in 1856. The frequency with which the Atlantis was published is another factor against the publication's success. 
It never held a regular publication schedule. It was published twice annually and quarterly at different periods, potentially making it too ad hoc for its readers. This irregularity and inconsistency should not be overstated, though. The Atlantis issued five volumes over 12 years, with some volumes encompassing nine numbers each. So the Atlantis published quite a bit of material in its lifetime despite not doing so on a fixed schedule. Ultimately, the Atlantis will never be known as a central 19th century periodical. A cynic could even assert that the Atlantis is only discussed today because of its affiliation with John Henry Newman. In my opinion, this approach is a little too nearsighted. Anyone who thinks this way limits their understanding to minute fragments of the periodical, and they limit their investigation to the magazine's primary figure. Newman is a starting point from which the magazine builds, and exploring its depths reveals some interesting analysis. The Atlantis pioneered a new form of publication which combined scientific and literary writing. It accommodated a specific university, and while this was not the first time that a publication had this objective, the Atlantis was an integral component of the new Catholic University of Ireland. It was intended to unite faculty members and disciplines. It was considered a primary means of uniting modes of thinking that would otherwise remain distinct. It helped to build a community and had a specific place in building an entity that still exists today. Perhaps it did not achieve commercial success, but it was one pillar among many which contributed to a prominent university's culture, and it remains an interesting historical artifact worthy of further study. So the next time that you're looking for something interesting to study and write about, consider the Atlantis. Like its contents in the 19th century, it has more to offer than the external reader may believe. If you are wondering where to begin with your research, here are some resources that I recommend. The Waterloo Directory is the first resource that I consult in all of my research on these subjects. It provides a quick overview of all pertinent information about a publication, and it gives a researcher a comprehensive listing of sources that write about the publication. The Dictionary of National Biography has an astounding bibliography of John Henry Newman. The resource undergoes a rigorous editorial process, so a researcher can be assured that the information is accurate. Ask About Ireland provides a brief but pertinent biography of William K. Sullivan. And Alini's chapter about science in the Oxford History of the Irish Book, Volume 4, offers tremendous insights on this periodical and others. Finally, Stephen Collini's work on John Henry Newman is worth investigating, and I believe that this book, What Are Universities For?, is one of the most astute evaluations of contemporary higher education that I have encountered. Thanks for listening.